Well, guys, grab a Bible. Tonight, join us in the book of Psalms. We're going to be in Psalm 144 tonight. Psalm 144, excited just to see the things that are there. We hope you're already making your way and grabbing hold of a Bible. If you haven't done that, do that now. Grab a Bible, open up one, open up electronically one way or another so that you're not just listening, but you're actually tracking, reading, thinking, and that it would be a time tonight that God's Word would meet us in help. So let's ask Him for that. Would you join me? Let's go before Him again in prayer and just ask that He would take His Word and help you and I to understand and hear what He says to us. Father, we do just bring this moment before you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you and your faithfulness have given us what we need. I think of how you word it there in Peter, where you tell us everything necessary for life and godliness. Through your precious promises, through what you've unpacked for us here, that's given to us in this life in Christ. That's a pretty abundant promise, everything we need. Believing that, Lord, I ask that you would take your word and effectively, abundantly, help us to hear your voice tonight. Open up your word to us, Father. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Well, I quote for a moment, and many of you will immediately recognize this familiar promise given to us in Second Chronicles that is so meaningful always, but certainly now. In fact, let me just show you the whole verse. It begins there in Second Chronicles chapter 7. When God speaks to the land, he says, When I shut up heaven, and there is no rain, or command the locust to devour the land and send pestilence among my people. Pause again and just think about it here. He's, he's talking about times where all of a sudden life gets hard, that perhaps even he's doing a hand of disciplining in his people. Now, I want to pause and say I'm not saying that the coronavirus, the COVID-19 that we're facing right now is that, but I'm not saying it's not either. It certainly is a place because God says whenever this is happening, whenever something like this kind of steps in to deal with my people, he says, when I send that, he then gives us this promise. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. That's what we need, is it not? Uh, a space right now that we would look and think we need healing, we need God to, to, to do a work in this. And he's inviting us to be a people who pray, who trust him. We talked about it in our announcements. T tomorrow is the National Day of Prayer, a time when our nation sets aside to do that. And I want to tell you, Hey, that's a, always a good place, but I hope it's where you are. I hope in this moment and this time in history, it's compelling you to pray. Well, I want to draw your attention to that from this psalm, because somewhere in the midst of that, that's where David was. David's writing a psalm here, and we can't lock it down entirely, but it seems to be a moment where Maybe he had just been made king, or maybe it's a place where he's looking over just his responsibility that God has given him in leading the nation, and it seems to be a pivotal moment, one of both him acknowledging God's favor, but also asking for his help. And that's where we are. I mean, this is where we are. So I want you to hear this psalm tonight, not only as a help to understand David and help to understand the things that are there, but more to heal, to have him speak to us about what he would say to us in this moment, that he would cause us to be those who in this moment are responding to him in the midst of this COVID-19, in the midst of this time, that we would be those where God would say, if my people would humble themselves and pray, that that would be where we are. Well, that's where David is. 
as he begins this whole thing and he writes this psalm somehow in one of those occasions, he begins so by doing just a place of acknowledging just his personal relationship with God. I, I just want you to note that. And, and so let's just read it and then we'll talk about it. Verses 1 and 2. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle, my loving kindness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and the one in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. Now, as you read this, and there's some incredible words that David uses here, but you have to catch that one of the most significant things is that nine times, nine times in two verses, he uses the word my. That there is this place where he's saying, this is what it is to me. That's why I'm kind of calling this little section here just this personal relationship, this place where David's acknowledging what God is to him, that, that what he does. Out of those nine times, six times, he's describing what God is, who God is, that, that what God is, is to him. Three times he's going to describe how God helps him. So let's go back and note that. Let's look at those six, just briefly without diving deep into them. But he just begins it there in verse one by saying, blessed be the Lord, my rock. He's like, you know who God is to me? He's my, he's this rock. And David would use this term a number of times in his life and in his Psalms that speak of God as strength and power and security, that he would say, this is what God is to me. He's my rock. He goes on in verse 2, and he says, my loving kindness, who God is to me. He's the one that is meeting me in this place where he's my loving kindness and my fortress, that he's the, 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 the place of my safety. He's my high tower and my deliverer, my shield, and the one in whom I take refuge. As you hear David just pile on these words that describe the help that he finds in God, that he would say, you know what God is to me? He's my safe place. He's my refuge. He's the one that I take refuge in. He's, he's love to me. He's kindness to me. He's strength. He's the one that is all of these things. He's the one that is that. And God is indeed all of that. But obviously the, the key for you and I is that you could say this that you wouldn't just hear David saying that this is what God is to him, but that you could hear that and you would be able to say, yeah, that's my, he's my God. He's my rock. He's my help. He's the one that is, is all of that and more to me, that he's the one that, that does that, that he's the one that works that. And then David notices again what, not only who God is, but what God does for him. And you get this opening kind of just, explanation there in verse 1 where he says, blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for battle. Who trains, sorry, trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Now, I don't know if that's just troubling right off the bat, but please understand, David was indeed a warrior. Uh, we know him as the one who fights and takes down Goliath. We know him as one who unites the, the, the nation of Israel and, and does lead them in, in military battle. But David just notices this and says, you know the reason I can do that? It's because God has made me for it. He's the one, he trains me. He, he, he strengthens me to do that which he has put before me. In fact, he'd go on to kind of capture that in verse 2 where he says, he subdues my people under me. That David would recognize not only his success in leading the nation, being able to fight back their enemies, but also how God just unified the people under him. And he just recognized God is the one who did that. David is known as one of the greatest kings that Israel ever had. And there is a sense of just acknowledging his ability and his hand in so doing. Applicationally, hey, for you, you're not a king. I'm not a king. That's not going to be the exact same place that God is speaking to us about these things. But it is a place where we would just recognize that he's the one that strengthens us for everything that he has for our lives. 
that you would be able to say, he's the one that makes my hands able. He's the one that makes me able to do those things which God would have me to do, and it just strengthen and cause that. And I want to tell you how beautiful that is, and yet how needed it is that God would be that. In fact, it might just be worth you noticing that all of these things are not a past tense. David's not describing what God did do. He's describing what God is doing. That when he uses the, the phrase there, he says, you know, blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains, not trained, who's training me, who's teaching me, who's helping me, who's training my hands for, for war and my fingers for battle, who's subduing. I mean, there is this picture of recognizing in everything that, that's here, it's a very present and personal relationship with God. And I just want to tell you how beautiful that is. I just want to tell you how good that is. And in many ways, that is what God wants for you. He wants you to be able to acknowledge that God is God in your life, that he's the one that is these things, uh, does these things. And that's exactly where you need to be right now. Where we think about where we are as a nation, we think about what's happening in our world. That you would have a relationship with him and he would be your God. He would be the one that's helping you in this moment. That's what David acknowledges that God is. That God's the one that does this. Now, as soon as he does that, he then moves into this next section where he not only acknowledges that, but he pictures this humble relationship that he has with God. Catch the wording in verse 3. Lord, what is man that you take knowledge of him? Or the son of man that you're mindful of him? Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. It's not the first time that David used these phrases. It's used in Psalm 18 as well. Some of you will recognize it. But it's a good acknowledgement where he acknowledges how small we are. That in one sense, who are we that the God of the universe would, would know us and step into our lives and care and, and the idea of this is just to acknowledge how frail we are, how small we are, how needed we are. It, like, what a crazy thing. That, that We're like a breath. I mean, our lives in, in the scheme of eternity, we're in this place like a passing shadow, and yet God acknowledges us. Now, this is what makes this important. Putting verses 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 together give this beautiful, well-rounded relationship with God that in one sense acknowledges how great it is to have a relationship with God that God knows me and he's my rock and he's my strength at the same moment humbling ourselves under him I think about how it words it for us in first Peter where he would say you know God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. The God invites us, said, you know, he resists it when people, you know, are prideful and elevate themselves, but he gives grace to the humble. And so the application is that we should humble ourselves under his mighty hand so that he could exalt us. He could strengthen our hands for war, if you will. That he could be the one that would enable all of that, casting all our cares on him. So this beautiful balance becomes this place of recognizing, our, in one sense, our elevated status, this incredible relationship that we can have with God. At the same moment, this humble approach to it. And I want to tell you how beautiful it is to see these two things side by side. I wish it was always so, and, and maybe some of you will catch this easier than others, but sometimes there are people who rejoice in who God is, but they do so in such a way that almost is arrogant, where you just kind of get this just from them that they just feel superior or, or greater or, you know, just above others. And, and you're like, that just doesn't feel right, though. I mean, God is amazing. Other times you'll find some people that feel like they're nothing, uh, that they're humble, but they, they, they somehow lack that, that confidence that comes from a relationship with God, from being there, Yet these two things coming side by side are such a beautiful thing. And David's there, where David's like, you know who God, he's my God, he's my rock, but who are we that God would take knowledge of us? To hold these two things together is a beautiful place, and I invite you to that. 
I invite you into a place that that would be where you are. Well, with this background, and since it is, David's acknowledging what God is to him, and then he's acknowledging his humility, the rest of the song really becomes a request. Now, we're going to break it up into a couple places because it does break up, but honestly, the whole thing flows together as David asking for God now to work, which is indeed what we're longing for. It's a part of what prayer is, as we come and say, God, we need you, we need your, your work, we need you to do this. He does so in, in beginning to picture God's response in a very active way. He gives us this visual picture of almost how that would look. So kind of catch it, try to imagine this as you pick up reading there in verse 5. Bow down your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains and they shall smoke. Flash forth lightning and scatter them. Shoot out your arrows and destroy them. Stretch out your hand from above. Rescue me and deliver me out of great waters from the hand of foreigners, whose mouth speaks lying words and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. So David is asking for God to work, but he touches in this visual picture of God moving in power and majesty, probably tying in a little bit to even the picture in Exodus when God comes down on the Mount Sinai to give the law and thunders and and moves. And yet it's more than that. It's this picture of a God who is connecting and moving in power where he's, he's longing that, 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 that God would come almost as if the, the mountains would smoke and his lightnings would come and his arrows would move and, and God would act in the situation that's in front of David. One of the most amazing things is that is exactly who God is. God is not in some distant reality just watching from afar. He's not just an observer in our world. He's actively working. He's a God who hears prayer and moves in it in, in a way that even as we just prayed together a few moments ago, God is, he's a God who hears and answers that. I like the way it says it in the, in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah 64, it gives it to us this way. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God besides you who acts for the one who waits for him. Our God acts for the one who waits for him. He steps in. He's a powerful, amazing God, and that's what David's longing for. He's looking at this and acknowledging that that he's longing for that reality, and that's what we're longing for and need. Now, the picture probably is even more beautiful than that because for some of you, you're already thinking it. This request for God to act, it's a present reality. And certainly as David was thinking it through, he was longing for that. But it's also a picture of what we're longing to have happen. Kind of a picture of Jesus' return. A picture of God stepping in and and doing this. Imagine that from that perspective where he says, you know, bow down your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Like, come back, Lord Jesus. Touch the mountains and they shall smoke. Flash forth lightning. And that's, you know, Jesus described his coming back. He said it would be like lightning from one side of the sky to the other. Just scatter them, shoot them by yours, destroy. Stretch out your hand from above and rescue me out of the hand of great waters. One of the fun things is that's exactly what we need now, but that's exactly what's going to happen when Jesus comes back. And maybe soon, (laughs) and maybe soon, that's the God we have. That's the God who is working. That's the the, the God that we get to rescue and lean into. This is the God that David's acknowledging, where he's saying, this is what my God is to me. He's my rock. He's my loving kindness. He's my deliverer. He's my, my fortress. I recognize my humility, but this is what he's looking for for God to do. Does that describe your relationship with God, a place where you would look at that and say, that's exactly where I am. It's a scary thing, but sometimes for some of God's people, they they begin to move away from that and they almost begin to be practical atheists. 
that, to, to say, I believe in God, but they don't really believe in God. They don't really believe that God hears or answers or moves, that they think in many ways life is all up to us, and, you know, God helps those who help themselves, and we got to make things happen, and I just want to tell you, that's, that's a place that cuts us off from that, where God is longing. He's inviting us to be a people who believe in Him, who ask Him, who look to Him, who trust in Him. And that's what we're needing now, a space where that, wherever you are, whatever's going on right now, whatever that looks like in you, that you would believe that God hears. And you would be saying like David, God, come down. God, move in majesty. God, move in power. God, scatter these things that are, that are they're set up against me. Rescue me out of the trouble that I'm in. Actively believing in our God who is a God who hears. I invite you to believe that and, and, and to step towards God in that way. Well, David's going to come back to that. In many ways, he kind of builds to that, and he's starting to ask his request in verse 8. But then he pauses and, and kind of moves into another thought for a second. It's worthy of us noticing it because he then moves to worship. And he says in verse 9, I will sing a new song to you, O God. On a harp of ten strings, I will sing praises to you. To the one who, who gives salvation to kings, who delivers David, his servant, from the deadly sword. He says, you know, I'm going to be that one who worships you. I'm going to sing to you. It's this place where he's deciding but also declaring. I mean, he's just asked for God to move in power, but he stops in the middle and says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing to God. I'm going to worship him as the new song. On a harp of ten strings, I'm going to praise you because he's the one who gives. He gives salvation to kings. He delivers David, his servant, as he recognizes what God has done and in many ways believing what God will do. Worship becomes a powerful reality of, of how we connect. So in the midst of us asking for God to work, in the midst of that, to, to be able to worship Him, and literally, sometimes it just helps to sing to Him, to, to stop in the middle of, of where you are and what you're facing and worship Him. I, I like that David uses even the idea of a new song. David Guzik, in his commentary, says it this way. He says, I will sing a new song to you, O God. New victories and new deliverance required a new song. God's love and help for David were always fresh and new, so his praise also would be. That's a little bit of this idea, that David's stepping into this and saying, God, I'm celebrating you. I'm not just celebrating you in the past. I'm celebrating you in the present. Now, let me try to help that just a little bit. We have a huge problem of sometimes that's the hardest place for us to live in the present moment. We can live in the past. We can live in the future, but to live here. But everything in this psalm is that present moment where David's celebrating what God is to him, that God is the one who trains his hands for war. And he's celebrating what God is in this moment. Worship, in that sense, is meant to be that way. And one of the weird things that can happen is that, for some of us, worship can become kind of like looking at a photo album of things that we used to be thankful for. Some of you have some really favorite songs, maybe some hymns that you really, really love, and, and you always love when they're sung, but here's the weird thing. It's not really a present thing for you. It reminds you of the past. It reminds you of what God was or something that you, you did do, and it's not really this present moment where you're saying, God, I want to sing to you right now and say, Lord, I love you. I, I'm so thankful for you that, I, that in this moment, I want to worship you. That's a little bit of this idea of coming. And David has that relationship with God where he's worshiping him now. He's worshiping him in a present and a real way. And that's powerful. That is powerful. That, that to be those who step into whatever we're facing and do that. Some of you have already been doing that in this season and you already know that sometimes in the midst of facing difficulties or the midst of facing problems, one of the best things to do is to actively worship. And so some of you do that. You, you, you put in your favorite CD, you pull it up on iTunes or Spotify and, and Pandora, and you play a song, and it just, you just, you just meet you, and you're able to, to just step from this moment into worshiping God. And I want to tell you, that's a good thing. Do that. Because that's what David's doing. 
He's being able to acknowledge who God is and and says, I'm going to sing. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sing and celebrate what God is. Well, with that moment of worship, with that moment of acknowledging it, he now moves back to this place of prayer. So we'll kind of call this next section really a dependent relationship with God. And it really is this place where he's definitely asking for God to work, definitely asking for God to intervene in his time. Notice what he says. Verse 11, rescue me and deliver me from the hand of foreigners whose mouth speak lying words, whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood, that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as pillars sculpted in palace style, that our barns may be full supplying all kinds of produce, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields that our oxen may be well laden, that there be no breaking in or going out, that there be no outcry in the straits. So David begins this request, and we're not exactly sure all that he's facing. There's a number of places in the midst of it, but you should be able to catch it because he said it twice, where he's really talking about three things that all flow together. He says there in verse 11, rescue me and deliver me from the hand of foreigners, whose mouth speak lying words, and whose right hand is a hand of falsehood. Pause there and recognize that's kind of where he'd left off right before he worshiped. So you go back there, and you you see there in verse 7, stretch out your hand from above, rescue me and deliver me out of great waters, from the hand of foreigners, from whose mouth speak lying words, whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. So David feels this. He feels oppressed by this around him. Now, for you and I, the application is a little bit different. It's not a national division. It's more of a spiritual division. If we wanted to put this in maybe New Testament or, or, or a place that would really be true through us, it would, the idea of foreigners would be recognizing unbelievers, those who aren't, the, they're not part of the, of the kingdom of God. They're not part of, of, of us as a, as a people. They're outside of that. And, and he just feels, says, Lord, you, you just rescue me from these things because lies. The lies permeate so much. They're just, they speak lies. In fact, falsehood is their strength. Falsehood is their right hand. That's powerful for you and I to think through, and that's important for us to tie into this moment because that's actually the world in which you and I live. You and I live in a world where that's the problem, where those are the things that are, that are taking place in the midst of this. I think about Jesus when he would talk about it in John 8, He says, why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. So Jesus is dealing with those who are rejecting him and, and not listening to his words. And he's like, well, you know, why, why aren't you listening? Because you're not of, of my father, you're of your father, the devil. Because he's a liar. That's what he does. From the very beginning, from Genesis 3, he lied. Lies become that which mark everything that Satan does in our world. And in that reality, it marks our world. It marks the things that are in the midst of that. But Jesus is so different. I mean, I I hope you understand this. He's not that. In fact, I think about when he was talking to Pilate as he was about to go to the cross. Pilate's talking to him, and, you know, Pilate said, said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered and said, You rightly say that I'm a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? Pilate's question is one of those questions that hang in the air, that we live in a world where this political leader in his time, it looks as, well, what's that? What's truth? I want to be very careful in in what I say at this moment, but I I think that you would just be able to reflect with me that not much has changed in that sense. We live in a world 
where so often the question is, well, who can you trust? So many things are distorted. So many things are, are known by lies. We think about so much of the wrestling that's happening in our world right now, and for some of you, you just, your, your heart just echoes this. You right now could say this. It's like, God, rescue us. Rescue us from lies. Rescue us from falsehood. Rescue us from those who, who perpetrate that, who cause that. I mean, that, that's so much a part uh, of the biggest problems in our world. But Jesus is not that. Jesus says, I'm a king of truth. And those who are of the truth, they'll hear my voice. They'll respond to that. That hopefully if you're his, you're attracted to that. That you're like, I want that. I love that he is true and trustworthy. And everything he says is, is that. But it's not our world. And so in that, it becomes one of our needs right now. God, would you rescue us? Because you know. You, you see what's true. You see what's false. You see what that looks like on a national level. You see what that looks like, you know, in, in, our, in our world in a small level. You see what that looks like in the midst of families. You see what that looks like in the, in the midst of our world and our situations that are right now. And for some of you, you just look at that and that's, that's so much says it. It's like, God, this is so not true. There's so many things that are happening here that are so destructive and they're just lies. If we could be rescued from lies, that would be what would be help, so helpful. So David asked for it. David asked for it. He's just saying, God, would you do this? Would you, would you do this? And then he talks a little bit about what it would do. And seven times he uses the word that. So he's going to say, you know, if you would do that, if you would rescue us, then these are the things that were, would happen. And there's this beautiful picture of blessing that would flow almost in this idea of concentric circles. It really begins in his home, in his family. And he says, you know, that your sons may be as plants, in verse 12, grown up in their youth, that their daughters may be as pillars, sculpted in palace style. He's like, God, we just want this blessing this blessing that would begin here and it would begin in this close circle of my family, of my kids, and just longing for that to, to, to be there. And then it would go on to outside that to, to his provision into our lives and family, where he'd say in verse 13, that our barns may be full, supplying all kinds of produce, that our sheep may bring forth thousands, ten thousands in our field, that our oxen may be well laden. God, would you bless? Would you, would you cause not only this, but the blessing that is around, that is taking care of us, that's being the one that God, who says that he would give us our daily bread, that he would be that supply. For somebody right now, that's for you, because that's one of your biggest fears right now. In the midst of just all that's happening in our world, you're, you're concerned of being able to provide for your family or your future or your retirement or whatever that is. You're, you're thinking through these things. And it's like, Lord, would you, would you pour out blessing? Would you rescue from falsehood so that not only my family would be blessed, that's where it starts, but then also your provision, your work in our lives, everything that's taking place there. But then he goes beyond his family and, and just the, the provisions to just the state of the neighborhoods, the, the nation, if you will, as he says it this way in verse 14, that there be no breaking in or no going out, that there be no outcry in the streets. And it's this picture of, of peace and a lack of turmoil and a lack of confusion and, and a lack of, of the enemy coming in or, or people being missing and lost, that there would be this beautiful picture God's blessing that would be there. So that's what David's asking for. He said, God, would you, would you, I just long that you would bless. I long that you would rescue and, and that it would be this blessing in, in these areas that would, that would touch my family, but that would touch our nation. That's what we need. That's where we need to come right now. That's the kind of praying and dependence that we're needing in this moment that would be able to ask God for to do that. And so David's recognizing all this. He, he's recognizing how that works into his life. And then he just says it this way in verse 15. Happy are the people who are in such a state. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. That's an amazing stamp. <laughs> I just want you to hear that. That he's talking about this happy relationship with God. 
this place where he says, if you could know this, if you could know everything that he's talking about in this psalm, that this personal relationship with God, this humble relationship with God, this place where you are recognizing God's active work, worshiping, dependency, trusting, asking for him. He says, if you could live in this place where God is your God, happy. <laughs> that, that, that's just what it would be. And, and that's really a good place, a, a place of recognizing the joy of that. I don't even go into it. There is some of a discussion among Christians about the difference between happy and joy, and you could say this would be joy. It's not a, a circumstantial base necessarily, although it is knocking, putting blessings. One of the interesting things about this word is it's, all, it's never used of, of God in that sense. It's always used of his people. That The Hebrew word that's used here speaks of those who are in a right relationship to God. And in that sense, they find themselves just overjoyed by it. I was thinking about that, and just one of the first things that came to my mind is, is a well-known classic, and I just give it as a recommendation, uh, just that Hannah Smith had written just, you know, the Christian secret of a happy life. And there is something about just recognizing that there is a, a, a joy. There is a happiness. There is a, a place that can be found in stepping into the kind of relationship that God would have for our lives. And that's exactly what David is just rejoicing in. And it is so much what we need. As he looks at this, he says, you know, happy are the people whose God is the Lord. And I think about that, and I think about how it was worded in Psalm 33, where it simply said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people that he has chosen as his own inheritance. I can't help but again just pause and say, we need to be crying out for our nation. That's where the only place where we'd be blessed, where as a nation, we would be a people that turn to God, and it is the, really the only great hope for our land. I just want to take a moment and encourage that to pray for our land, pray for our nation, and I don't want in any sense to deaden that. But then I want to just be a little bit very clear biblically. For us in Christ, the nation that we're celebrating is not the United States. It's the, the people that we've become a part of, which is the church which is God's people, that we've become those people that know his blessing. I like the way it gives it to us in Ephesians 1, where it simply says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He says, we've become the blessed people in Christ, that it's in Christ where this place is that God has given us everything, that everything that, that's in the midst of that, that you could honestly say that's the, the real life to live. That's the happy life. I'm certainly encouraging that for us right now, and I'm telling you as Christians, that's where God wants to draw us into, that we would be able to do, well, some of you reading in Thessalonians today, that we'd be able to rejoice always, and we'd find a joy, a happiness in Him. This definitely is an encouragement that it would be there, but I also want to speak to you who are tuning in right now that don't know Jesus. Because I want to tell you it's not found anywhere else. That when he looks, he says, happy are those people whose God is the Lord. That when you would discover that God, when you'd step into that relationship with God, having a personal relationship with God, that that would be the thing that would rescue now and eternally. That that would be the life worth living. That that would be real happiness. It's what God is holding out to you, that he's telling us that there in Ephesians where it says, you know, that every blessing, spiritual blessing in the heavenly place is given to us in Christ. See, what Jesus did is he came and died for us to bring us into this relationship. So if you're outside of that, I'm just telling you, it's not going to be found anywhere else. If you're looking for happiness in money or pleasure or power or success, then you'll find emptiness because ultimately that's where it goes. True fulfillment, true happiness is in this relationship with God. It's the only place that it can be found. And that's what David's just acknowledging. He's in a place of saying, this is what he has for us, that we would be a people that know that joy, that know that happiness, that have that life. And I just want to tell you this is true. And I hope you have a taste of this. But if we're all together honest, there's not one of us who's fully entered into that yet. 
this is true. It's like if, if you could see, it's like that's where I want to be. I know that's the real Christian life rightly lived, but right now I'm living less than that. I'm, I'm living beneath what it could be. And so David's just acknowledging, hey, if you could get to this, happy are the people who are in such a state that it's a present state that you're in. What state? Well, everything we talked about, that it's personal, that right now God would be your God. He would be your rock. He would be the one strengthening you in this moment but not in an arrogant way, in a humble way, that you would rec- you'd connect to God and yet do so humbly and yet believing, believing by faith that he's a God who hears and answers, asking for that, doing so not in an accusatory or unbelieving way, but a worshipful way, that you're in this present moment acknowledging who God is and then asking for him to work, asking for him to step in, That's the state that David says, if you could be there, if you could stay in such a state, a place of where God is your God and you're trusting him and you're worshiping him and you're, you know, finding this humble, that's, that's real joy. Happy are the people who are in such a state. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. And that's where God's inviting you and I into. That's what he's doing. And I just want to call you to that. I want to call you to that for you, but one more time, I want to call it to you for our nation, that today is a day that we need this, and in our nation, this is one of those places that it should be, and so I, I think I'm speaking to somebody in a way that would just say, of course, that's what we should be doing. Of course, I mean, that we should be acknowledging that this is what our nation needs, that, that we need what this is, and so we should be a people, of all people, who are praying for our land and praying in this season for God to work. And so I just want to speak that to you. I just want to speak that to you and tell you, hey, this is a great psalm to, to step into and say, God, this is what we want. We want your joy. We want your happiness. We, we need that rescue that would be from you. Would it be that we'd become a people that are praying for that? that we would say, of course, this is, what I, this is where I want to go. This, this is exactly, you know, the way that I want to respond to this, both for my nation, my family, but for my own soul, and just say, God, I see it. I see what that looks like. Oh, that would be real joy. That would be real happiness if I could fully step towards that. So that's my invitation to you tonight, that right now, David's words would become your words. And more than that, the state that he's speaking about wouldn't be something idyllic or just this place of, well, that's, that's good for somebody else. They can have that. But it'd be a place that you would step towards it, that you would step towards having that relationship with God. So let's ask him for that. You can close your Bibles and let's just ask that God would bring us towards this, that he would help us to step towards this true relationship with him, that he would help us step towards this trusting in him and knowing him and and finding him to be our help. Would you join me right now? Let's ask for it. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. God, you are a rock. You are our deliverer. You are our refuge. You are our loving kindness. You are everything that we need, and oh, that it would be so tonight that we would not be a people that just read it, but would say, "That's you are my God. You are my rock. You are my fortress. God, you are. God, would you step towards that? Would you draw us into that? Would you draw us into a place of finding you to be everything to us, our source, our life, our help? And then would you bless? Would you rescue us? Oh, please rescue us. Lord, from the the lies, the broken things in our world, and the brokenness that that just so permeates so much of that. God, there are situations that we just lay before you right now and we ask for them. Situations in families, situations in, in people's just worlds that it's just so personal and it's all together there. Lord, would you rescue? But then we bring our nation before you right now. We think about tomorrow being the National Day of Prayer. We think about this really weird season of the COVID-19. And Lord, we should be those who are crying out, who are asking for you to bless. 
that you would rescue us and bring us into a happy state. Bring us into a place of, of trusting you and that you would do an awakening, a reviving work in our land where you would say, if my people who are called by my name, that if we would humble ourselves and pray, if we would turn from our wicked ways, if we would seek you, then you would hear. And that's what we need. That's what we're asking for. God, that you would do a work. We're asking for that now. I'm asking for it. I'm asking that you would pour out blessing and rescue and help and draw us to this happy state of you as our God and us walking with you. Meet us individually, draw us to that. And then, Lord, I pray very specifically for any that don't have that, that right now, they're, they're, not only are they struggling with it in an on-again, off-again kind of way that sometimes happens for believers, but they don't know anything about it. They're outside of the promises of hope. God, I pray for those who are lost this evening, and that you'd bring them to Christ, that you'd bring them to the only thing that brings blessing and life and hope, that you would rescue, that you would turn hearts to you and bring them to recognize you as their God. In Christ, through that, I ask for that right now and trust you. Trust you for all that you are and all that you're doing. We ask for your work. In Jesus' name, amen.